Hello everyone, welcome to this video explanation of the rules for Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is a game of exploration and deduction for 1 to 4 players. It lasts about 60 minutes, and it's for ages 14 and up. The goal of the game is to be the player with the most victory points at the end of the game. Let's go through this setup that we've already done for a 3 player game. You will place both boards in the middle of the table. Each player will get a number of Quechua meeples that depends on the number of players. In a two-player game, you each get five meeples. In a three-player game, you each get four meeples, like this. And in a four-player game, you each get three Quechua meeples. Next, you will choose which type of scenario to play. A short scenario that uses half of the board, or a long scenario that uses the entirety of the central board. For this setup, we will use a long scenario. The scenario indicates which type of terrain tiles you need to place on the diversity board. There are sand, soil, grass, and rock terrain tiles with a number beside it. You also have the terrain type to set on the central board, as well as the crop tile that goes over it. Crop tiles are the round tiles here. There are five different kinds, and each crop is associated with an offering token. At the beginning of the game, each player will have a set of these tokens. So, here we have three sets of offering tokens. Once you've set the tiles, you will take the Pachamama wheel and insert the scenario disc into it, being careful to close the two windows. Finally, in the column below each terrain tile. Each player will place their diversity pawn, as well as their score marker on space 10 of the score track. Exploring will allow you to move only one of your meeples on the game board during your turn. You can move as far as you want, but you will be limited by the contents of the spaces through which you want to move. During your move, you can move freely through spaces with crop tiles or your own Quechua meeples in them. This means that opponent's meeples will block you. You will be able to move your meeples already on the board, or you can bring a new meeple into play. For example, if I want to move this meeple, I'd be able to traverse this space, since it contains a crop tile, continue my move through the space here, because it has a meeple of my color, change direction, you're always allowed to do this. Pass through this space that also contains a crop tile and end my move on this space. The final type of move that I could perform is to retrieve a meeple from the game board to return it to the supply. This is the only option that lets me ignore the movement rules. In other words, I can retrieve a meeple no matter where it is. If, during my move, I end up on a space that already contains a tile like this, nothing happens, and my turn ends. On the other hand, if, for example, I end my move here, where there aren't any terrain tiles, I will automatically make a discovery. When I make a discovery, I will have to place a terrain tile under the meeple I just moved. In this case, I'm going to take the Pachamama wheel, line up the coordinates of my meeple, in this case, the moon, and the turtle. Open the window that corresponds to terrain tiles, and look at the type of terrain that must go there. We can see here that it's rock terrain. So I'm going to take the rock terrain tile from the diversity board and place it under my meeple. Then, I progress on the diversity board in the column of the terrain I just placed. So, that's rock terrain. This will allow me to score points. I will score as many points as the number of diversity points of my color at the level I just attained. In this case, I will score two points. So, you can see that it's better to discover different types of terrain as you explore, rather than specializing in just one. I actually have certain clues to help me determine the type of terrain I will discover in a particular location. 
One of the clues is that orthogonally adjacent terrain tiles of the same type will form what we call regions. So, here we have a region of five spaces. We also know that a region can have a size of one to five spaces. So, here the region is at its maximum size. Thus, we cannot have rock tiles on these two locations here, nor can we have one here. Of course, we can have regions of only one tile, or of two, or three, or four tiles. The final clue we have is that two regions of the same type cannot be adjacent, neither orthogonally nor diagonally. Thus, for example, these two tiles here are diagonally adjacent, so they must be part of the same region. This in turn means that one of these two spaces absolutely must contain a soil terrain tile, possibly both, since we would then have a region of five spaces, which is the maximum size. Once you have finished your movement phase, you will be able to make an offering. But we'll come back to that later. The second action you could do is to perform a divination. Unlike exploration, which only involves one of your meeples, divination allows you to perform a divination with each of your meeples. Performing a divination allows you to announce the crop type that you want to plant on a space under one of your meeples. It's important to note that you can't just plant anything you want anywhere you want. Pachamama has imposed two rules that dictate the type of crop to be planted in any given location. The first rule is the rule of diversity. Basically, each region can only have different types of crops. For example, in this size five region, we must have one crop of each of the five types. In a region, we always start with the lowest valued crop tiles. This means that in a single tile region, we definitely will have a value one crop. And in a three space region, for example, we will have a value one crop tile, a value two crop tile, and a value three crop tile. The second rule is the rule of separation. When you have a crop planted, none of the spaces around it, orthogonally or diagonally adjacent, can have the same type of crop. Let's try a divination together, taking these two rules into account. For example, for this meeple here, I'm going to announce a value three crop. How did I come to this conclusion? Well, we have the diversity rule that tells us that all crops in a region must be different. We already have the one and the four, so that leaves us with the two, the three, and the five. With the separation rule, and considering this crop here, we know that three cannot go here or here. If we want to put the peppers in the region, we are therefore absolutely obligated to put them in this space. Let's verify this, so we don't make any mistakes. We once again align the coordinates, moon and turtle, and open the second window, which is for crops. It was totally peppers. So, we're going to place the peppers crop under the meeple. Scoring points equal to the required crop, which is to say three points. And then we gain an offering token corresponding to the type of crop planted, provided we don't already have one. Yeah, I don't have any peppers, so I can take an offering token. Let's try a second one together. Here, we are sure of what this space contains. We will use the separation rule. We already have a value one crop and a value three crop. And we know that these two spaces here must have the value two and value five crops in some order or another. So the only crop that can be planted here is corn. We will verify once again. Looks like we have the snake and the rainbow. We open the window and it's corn. I'm going to score again for the crop. In this case, four points. And take a corn offering token. Let's say I want to take a chance here. With the separation rule, because we have crops of values one, three, and four, we know that this is a crop of value two or five. 
I'm going to gamble and announce a crop of value two. Let's verify this by aligning the coordinates, the snake and the cloud, and check. Unfortunately, it should be a value five crop. Nonetheless, we go ahead and place the crop that's supposed to be there. And because I screwed up, I will lose points equal to the value of the crop placed. This time, five points. Pay attention to the fact that I lose points equal to the crop tile placed and not the wrong one I announced. When I'm wrong, I do not get any offering tokens. If I had not made a mistake in my divination, I could have made an offering at the end of my turn but my turn ended immediately because of the mistake, so it's the next player's turn. At the end of your turn, whether you explored or divined, you will be able to make an offering. Of course, that's assuming you didn't make a bad guess while divining. Making an offering permits you to return the offering tokens you have to the supply. The number of offering tokens you return will determine the number of victory points you score. Here, I have four tokens. The more different tokens, and they must all be different, the more points. I have four tokens, so I score six points. Of course, you can make numerous offerings during the game. The game ends as soon as someone places the final terrain tile. Notice that I said the last terrain tile and not the last crop tile. So, for example, here the white player makes the final discovery, places the tile, scores points for diversity, in this case, one point, and then we move on to the endgame phase. During this phase, starting with the player who triggered the endgame, and in turn order, each player can perform one divination for one of their meeples. And we will keep going like this until everyone has made a final divination for each of their meeples or has dropped out. Basically, during your turn, you can announce the type of crop you think should be planted under your meeple. You use the Pachamama wheel to verify whether your guess was correct. If so, place the crop tile, score the appropriate points, and possibly gain an offering token. Or you could opt to drop out. If you drop out, the game is completely done for you. Your usual turn to make a divination will be skipped for the rest of the game. Once everyone has dropped out, everyone gets to make one final offering to Pachamama with their remaining offering tokens and score the appropriate points. After this final offering, the player with the most victory points is declared the winner. If it's a tie, such as here, the tied player with the highest pawn on the diversity tracks is declared the winner. In this case, white wins the game. Now let's take a look at the setup to play Tiwanaku cooperatively. In this version, everyone works together to beat the Atoma player. Setup is essentially the same as in the competitive version of the game, with a few modifications that we'll see together now. The first modification has to do with the setup of the main board according to the scenario. If we take the scenario we used in the competitive version, we see that you have to add meeples on certain locations. These meeples represent the Atoma people. Once you have placed the Atoma people's meeples, you will also track points for their discoveries and for their crop tiles. In this case, the Atoma have already progressed on different diversity tracks and have scored those points. And they have scored the points for the crops they're already on. They have also gained the offering tokens corresponding to those crop tiles. Note that they only gain one corn offering token because you can only have one of each type. Each player gets a color of meeple. But everyone shares the same set of diversity tokens and one scoring pawn. You can see here that we used white for this player. Each player will receive a number of meeples that depends not only on the player count, but also on the difficulty level. We have a normal version and a difficult version. In the normal version, 
For a two-player game, each player gets four meeples. In a three-player game, each gets three meeples. In a four-player game, things change a little because we switch to a team mode, which is to say that we use only two colors of meeple, and each color is played by two players on a team. This means that they can use each other's meeples. In difficult mode, for a two-player game, each player gets three meeples. Here's a two-player hard mode setup. In a three-player game, each gets two meeples. In a four-player game, again, they play in teams, using only two colors. So, player one will use green, player two will use white, Player 3 will also use green, and Player 4 will also use white. The final difference has to do with the terrain tiles. Normally, these tiles are stockpiled on the diversity board, but here we deal them out to the players. Deal the terrain tiles by terrain type. That is to say, we'll divide the sand terrain tiles in two, since there are two players. Then the same with the soil terrain tiles, then the grass, and the rock. It's possible that the number of tiles does not divide evenly among the players. For example, in this two-player game, we might have an odd number of sand tiles. In this case, one player gets one more of them than their teammate. We have to do the same thing for each type of terrain. So we will try to give each player an equivalent total number of tiles in the end. Place these tiles behind your screen. Sorted by terrain type. Stacked with the arrow side of the tile facing up. In competitive mode, we use the other side. That's all there is to setting up cooperative mode. The game plays as usual, which is to say, until the final terrain tile is placed on the game board which is also when everyone has spent all of their tiles that were behind the screen. On your turn, you will have to spend a terrain tile, which will go to the diversity board, and then choose which action to perform, explore or divine. Both actions work the same way as in competitive mode except that if you choose to explore, your first move must match the arrow that you just played. For example, in this case, Green must start out by moving leftward. Then he could change direction as usual. So, like here, I could move leftward, and then I am perfectly allowed to move over here. If his move ends on a terrain tile, nothing happens. On the other hand, if he had decided to end up on this space here, he would have discovered it, just as in the competitive game, using the Pachamama wheel aligned to his coordinates. We need to check. He verifies the terrain tile he placed, which was grass, and takes this terrain tile from the diversity board, if it is available. In this case, there aren't any. So, players must choose who will place this terrain tile from their own supply. It could be the active player or his teammate. For example, in this case, the active player has only one green terrain tile left. So, he asks his teammate to play one of her two. She agrees and places the terrain tile under that meeple and scores the diversity points in the same way as in the competitive game. So, one point. When the active player has finished his move, no matter whether he made a discovery, it is the Otoma people's time to react. All of their meeples in the same column where he ended up and in the same row will move. They will try to move away from the green meeple that just moved. So, in this case, will of this guy that moves away for example, to here, where it would move off the board. But we can see that all around the board, there are these trails. Only the Otoma people can use these trails. So, he follows the trail, 
and continues until he stops on a completely empty space. On this space, he will make a discovery and perform a divination. We check the terrain type that should be at this location. Snake and water. And look at the terrain type. Yellow terrain. We're going to take that from the diversity board, if it's available. If it's not available, the players have to provide it from their own supplies. We will also place the crop tile. Don't forget that the Otoma people score diversity points for their discovery. In this case, two points plus three points for the crop. When the Otoma people have finished all of their moves, the next player spends a tile and chooses the action they will take. Divination works the same way as in the competitive game. Careful, because each player can only make divinations with their own meeples. On the other hand, we share the offering tokens we earn. At the end of either of our turns, we can make an offering. We will earn points just as in competitive mode, according to the number of offering tokens we have sacrificed. And the Otoma people will automatically make an offering with their tokens they have collected, and will score points accordingly. Here, the Otoma turn in five offering tokens, and thus score 10 points. If the Otoma people had had fewer offering tokens, of course, they would have scored fewer points. The game ends when the players all run out of terrain tiles from their supplies. Some of them might still be on the diversity board though, so the entire central board may not be completely discovered. At the end of the game, players immediately make a final offering, but there is no final divination round. The Otoma people also perform an offering with the tokens they have. And finally, the Otoma people will score one point per empty space. That is to say, each space without a crop tile atop a terrain tile. If the players have more points than the Otoma people, the players win. Here's the setup for the solo version of Tiwanaku. The setup is the same as for competitive mode, as if it were a two-player game, but one player is the Otoma people. So, you get five pawns, as do the Otoma. Place your diversity pawns and score marker on the board. There will also be one set of offering tokens destined for you. Setup for the Atoma people will be the same as in cooperative mode. That is to say, place the Atoma meeples as indicated in the scenario. The difference from cooperative mode is that the Atoma will use five meeples of different colors. So, if you play as white, the Otoma use the other five colors. The Otoma people will score for terrains they discovered according to their diversity. They will score for crop tiles where they are standing. However, they get no offering tokens. On your turn, you can choose between exploring or divining, as in the competitive mode of Tiwanaku. All of the exploration rules still apply, except that you cannot retrieve a meeple to return it to your supply. Once your meeples are in play, they stay there. When you go to discover a terrain, you will use the Pachamama wheel as usual. In this case, a rock terrain. Place the terrain tile arrow side up, keeping its orientation from the deck. Then, score your diversity points. In this case, one point. And then you move the Otoma. The arrow you just discovered indicates which color of Otoma meeple should move and in which direction. In this case, the dark blue meeple moves leftward. That meeple then makes a discovery and divination for the space where it ends up. 
They also score points for diversity and the crop. If you decide to make a divination, you must make divinations with all of your meeples on terrain tiles without crops. Even if you make a mistake during the divination, you should be pretty sure before you try it. You gain the offering tokens for your divinations, but the Otoma do not. At the end of your turn, you can make an offering to the Pachamama. The Otoma people do not. If, during a discovery, the revealed arrow is your color, that means the Otoma passed their turn, and it's your turn again. The game ends the same way as in competitive mode, which is to say, when the final terrain tile, not the final crop tile, is placed on the board. You can then make one final offering with the tokens you have. If you have more points than the Otoma people, you win. If it's a tie, the Otoma people win. Now you know all the rules of all three ways of playing Tiwanaku. Competitive mode, cooperative mode, and solo mode. I wish you excellent gaming, and see you soon.